just want to say that I'm going to be sharing everything I love about Passover tonight with you. Um, and uh, it was a real experience to put it all together, but mostly it's like welcoming you to our Seder in our, in our home. So I hope you um, enjoy. And all I want is for everybody to take home one little tidbit. If you get one thing out of the presentation that you can bring to your Seder, then I think you will have found um, this worth your time. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and um, we are going to take a look through uh, all the things that I love about um, the Passover Seder. So let's, um, Julie, are we, is that full screen? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Is that, uh, are we at full screen now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I called this art for your Seder, but I really think it could have been called art of the Seder or everything Jeanette loves about a Seder. Um, so the most important thing about having a Passover Seder is telling the story from generation to generation. In fact, we are commanded in the Torah in Exodus to tell the story of the Exodus of the Passover. On that day, you shall tell your child, for this, God has taken me out of the land of Egypt. What is this? It's the story of the Exodus and we hand it down to our children and they hand it to their children. And here we are thousands of years later, telling the story of our exodus from Egypt. But it's really a story about freedom and it's a story about your own respective families. And that's what I want everybody to think about tonight. What about your family, no matter where you come from, how long you've observed Judaism, or who's in your family and who's not there to, uh, this year at the Seder, you can bring your own history, your own tales of freedom to your Seder. So let's start at the beginning of how you tell the story. These are some of the Haggadot that we have in our house. We have many more, but these are my favorite. Um, my my uh, grandson just received uh, the PJ Library beautiful family Haggadah. So this year, we're going to be using that at our Seder. But we also use the ShopRite Haggadah. We use the Shik Haggadah. We use the Rabbinical Assembly Conservative Movement Haggadah and many, many other resources. In our family, we like to that everybody has the same Haggadah and then we supplement it with other resources. When you come to our Seder, the first thing we do in our house, and we've been doing this now for 36 years, is we ask you to sign a very special Haggadah um, that I'll talk about in a minute by David Moss. So we have a record of everybody who has been to our Seder. It means a lot, especially now that my mother is no longer with us, um, just to see this picture of her signing in at our Seder a few years ago with my niece. I love having this record because we can look back on who attended the Seder and as people get old and are no longer with us, it brings back wonderful memories. So find a page, insert it into a Haggadah, and you can have a, a family memory, a list of everybody who attended your Seder. I think you'll find it meaningful. David Moss is a friend of mine, but before he became a friend, he was somebody I admired in the Jewish art world. He lives in Jerusalem, and it's his Haggadah, who I, which I think really put modern Haggadot and modern art with Hag of Haggadot um, on the map. This is a page from the David Moss Haggadah. It's the Bechal Dor Vador, from generation to generation. In every generation, each person sees themselves as if they were leaving Egypt. Um, I really encourage you to uh, check out at either a library or bookstore the David Moss Haggadah to see how brilliant he interpreted each page of the Haggadah. This is David. Um, he was commissioned by uh, a collector in Florida in 1983 to create one Haggadah for the Levy family. 
it was so amazing that he and the family agreed to publish it. And in 1986, he published a limited edition and then later a more um, affordable edition, <laughs> which is the one we have. And I just think it's the most brilliant Haggadah. It's, sorry, it's one of two that have really informed my life as a Judaic artist. Um, interestingly, in, in thinking about what I was gonna talk about tonight and all the many Haggadot in the world, I think it was Lily Cowan, an American woman, who, who published a um, Haggadah in 1904, and she really set the stage for this idea of writing your own Haggadah or using um, the news of the day to uh, inspire Haggadot and to have modern artistic uh, Haggadot. And she's really credited with the plethora of Haggadot that have happened in the last 100 years. So we have um, Mrs. Philip Co Cowan or Lily Cowan to thank for that. The other Haggadah that has really influenced me as an artist is Arthur Schick. Um, we had this Haggadah in our house growing up. And then when I got married, Dan brought his um, Arthur Schick Haggadah to the house. And I, I think his illustrations are amazing. Um, they show life in Poland where he lived in the 1930s. And in fact, his first version of the Schick Haggadah had uh, the swastika um, painted on the snakes in the, uh, of the Egyptians. But um, the publishers uh, told him he had to get rid of the swastika because they were just too controversial. But Schick's Haggadah is a political statement against what he saw happening around him in Poland and Germany. And um, it has been published ever since 1936 and it is just gorgeous in its illustrations. Um, these are just some of the pages from the Schick Haggadah. Again, if you can get your hands on one just to see his illustrations, they're beautiful. Even, uh, sorry, ever since 1936, um, we have seen many forms of Haggadot. And you can go online today and see thousands of options. Um, and you can find a Haggadah that's perfect for your family. Um, I just wanna show you how our table looks at uh, Passover. Um, every year I have a different decoration, but some things stay the same. At our Seder table, every person gets um, a little um, a little bowl of hors d'oeuvres. It's usually just vegetables and fruit because we know a lot of food is coming, um, but it's something simple, but it's something to snack on um, as we start telling the story of uh, Passover. Everyone gets a Haggadah, um, and then everybody also gets a supplement to the Haggadah. So the picture you see in front of you that year, we were using the ShopRite Haggadah, and the supplement is created by my husband, Dan. I'll talk more about it later, but it's a very important part of our Seder because it keeps it different every year. He adds something new, something timely, something engaging, and we never know what it's going to be and Dan surprises us. I also include a place card or a bookmark. Now the bookmark is important because as we're going through the Haggadah and the supplement, you can mark your pages and it becomes a souvenir of uh, being at our Seder that year. On the back of the place card or the bookmark is a number and you'll see it in a minute. And that number is also very important. Everybody at our Seder gets a number and that tells you what job you are going to do in helping clean up. So if you're number one, you help serve the soup. If you're number two, you're on the team that clears the soup dishes, etc. It gives everybody a job during the Seder. And then finally, um, Dan sometimes organizes games, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but we've done Jeopardy, Truth or Dare, um, 20 Questions, and the game card is also at everybody's plate. This is what our supplement looks like. Um, it has my art on the cover, of course, but mostly it's all about um, projects that Dan has done over the years. So here's an example. Um, a few years ago, Dan read an article about a famous painting by Diego Velazquez, uh, painted in 1630, called Joseph's Tunic. And Dan posed the question, uh, what do you see in this painting? I'm not gonna go into all the details because he does a much better explanation. And this is all in the supplement. The painting 
ask the question, how did we get into the situation in Egypt? Why were we there? And why are we having to leave Egypt and observe um, Passover after the Exodus? And the answer is sibling rivalry. And Dan uses this painting to draw um, a comparison between what happened with Joseph and his brothers and his father having gone to or Joseph having gone to Egypt and the brothers um, and he's showing and these the brothers are showing um, the coat supposedly of their dead brother and it has the blood on it and then through um, different texts Dan that Dan includes in the supplement he shows us an, um, the connection between Joseph Jacob the coat and Karpas. Now, not everybody um, can do what Dan does with this particular example, but the idea is find something that interests you and put it into your family supplement to raise questions, to get people involved, and to get people guessing. Um, I made a bookmark out of um, this painting for that year because that became sort of the theme for the Seder that year. In the supplement also, Dan includes music. Um, in years when we have a lot of guests, he will send um, music digitized to everybody who's attending the Seder so they know the melodies. And we include the melodies in the supplement also so that everybody feels included and they can sing the same songs that we do. Um, and it's a great educational tool, tool for everybody who comes to the Seder. So try to include music if you can in your supplement. Um, so uh, especially with Zooming, we can um, send music ahead of time and try to sing together um, if it's a Zoom Seder again this year. Um, this is one of our favorite resources. Uh, Dan says that the Schechter Haggadah has the most interesting tidbits in it that he draws from and he uses in the supplement. But you can use any resources, anything in life, any news stories, make it about um, what's relevant to your family and the people who come to your Seder. Today, uh, there's a wonderful site called Haggadot.com where you can create your own personalized Haggadah. Um, so explore that if that interests you. And I encourage you to decorate the cover of whatever you bring to the table. So on, um, on my site, which I'll put at the end, uh, you can download for free the Seder plate design, or you can paper cut a design like this paper cut that illustrates the song Echad Mi Odea that we sing during the Seder, Who Knows One. Um, and this paper cut is an illustration of each of the verses. Um, at the end of the Seder, when we're singing all the different songs that are at the end of the Haggadah, our favorite one is um, Echad Mi Odea because we go around the table taking turns and it becomes a real game. It's a lot of fun. So this paper cut reminds me of the fun of that song. So let me talk a little bit about how I create a theme for each Seder. Um, I like the idea of a theme that's relevant to our family or to um, our lives that particular year. So let me, uh, oh, oh, let me just take a diversion for a second. These are glasses that I bought about 25 years ago and um, I add one every couple of years and they become, they're just for Passover. In fact, they're just for the Seder <laughs> because they're quite delicate, but they make the Seder table really, really special. Um, I do have links to everything I talk about tonight on my website. So um, don't worry about catching everything as I go through it really quickly. So this is what our Seder table looks like. And every year I try to add something a little bit special. I got a little bit crazy with the lights that go under the vases. I found them on Amazon for about $5 and they make it really fun to uh, light up the table. Um, this year, uh, you can see in the, inside the glasses are little dish towels that my sister sent that have frogs on them and they say happy Passover and that became a giveaway present, and it, it's the napkin that we use that year at the Seder table. So I um, like the idea that everybody is at the same table. Not everybody has a room or has a space for doing this, but we do limit how many people can come to our Seder by how many can fit at the tables that I put together. 
I'm just showing you how I take tables from around the house and I make them all into one table. So if a table is a different height, I go to Home Depot and get a piece of styrofoam and lift it up so that everybody's at the same height and then put a tablecloth over all these four different tables together. And it makes everybody feel really together if they're all at one table. By the way, we flipped our living room and dining room when we moved to this house so we could have a big Seder. And um, it allows us to have 25 people like this. So this is what our table looks like. And it's a little squishy, but um, we're all together. And let me just show you some of the uh, examples of themes that we've used during our Seder. So we took a trip to Egypt a few years ago. Um, we had a wonderful time and we left three days before the revolution. So we were very um, impressed with everything we saw in Egypt and we wanted to remember it when we were at the Passover Seder. It seemed most appropriate since we were exiting Egypt. Um, so the theme that year was Egypt. And I found a website that you could, uh, oops, um, you can actually put, type your name in and you get hieroglyphics. I don't know that they're real hieroglyphics, but they're hieroglyphics. And then you can make a color Xerox and everybody gets a bookmark um, with their name in hieroglyphics. And then um, on the back, of the bookmark is the number of the job that they have. So all the twos would be um, serving the dinner or the threes would be clearing the dinner. Um, so everybody has their job. And this was a tidbit from the Cairo Museum that Dan taught us about. This is all on the back of the bookmark. And then at the end, um, I laminated the bookmark. So this is a different year, a different theme. This year's theme was the flowers of Israel. And the way I made the bookmarks is very simple. I found pictures of Israel, of flowers of Israel, and I put them onto one photograph and I sent them to Costco. And then I cut them apart and then I laminated them at a local Kinko's. And that became the bookmark that we used during the Seder and a souvenir of being at our Seder that year. And I think I had um, Israeli flowers on the table during the Seder. So that was the theme for that particular Seder. Now I wanna talk and I'm gonna digress for a moment um, about a very special uh, family thing we have. Um, so this year in 2010, the theme of the Seder was the Prato Haggadah. Dan, who I've talked about already being my husband and so special about Passover, um, has done a lot of genealogy and he's very active in, in the genealogy, Jewish genealogy world. Um, Dan discovered, and I did not know this growing up, that I had a great uncle who was an art dealer in Rome. He was my grandmother's uncle and uh, we didn't know anything about him. And Dan discovered that Ludwig Pollock, um, my grandmother came from the Pollock family, um, was an art dealer in Rome. In, in the early 1900s, he made an amazing discovery. He found in a Mason's backyard, a piece of the very famous Lacoon statue. The Lacoon um, is a statue at the Vatican um, the, and Ludwig found this arm, a piece of an arm, and he wrote academic papers theorizing that it came from the Lacoon. When he proved in 1906 that this piece of the elbow came from the Lacoon, he donated it to the Vatican. The Pope at the time gave Ludwig Pollock the um, order, the highest order, uh, the commander's cross, uh, the highest order that the Pope gives. And he was the first Jew to receive that. Um, he then let, went on to become the director of the Museo Baracco, the Museum of Sculpture in Rome. But in 1943, when the Jews of Rome were being threatened and then told that they would be rounded up, the Pope's um, 
art historian, art consultant, called Ludwig and said he could protect him if he and his family would convert to Catholicism. And the story goes that he refused to convert to Catholicism and they were rounded up. And this you see here, his family, they died on the way to Auschwitz. Um, Ludwig was um, somebody we didn't know about. Um, during his career, one of his possessions was a Haggadah that was written in the 13th century. It's called the Prato Haggadah because after Ludwig died in the Holocaust and his sister survived, um, the Haggadah was given to the chief rabbi of Rome, David Prato. So that became the Prado Haggadah. Eventually it was sold to the Jewish Theological Seminary where it is today. We didn't know any of this until Dan told us. So this is a picture of the inside of the Prado Haggadah. It's illuminated. It was um, illuminated in the 1300, 12th to 1300s. Um, and Dan surprised me 10 years ago and we went to the Jewish, Jewish Theological Seminary to see the Prado Haggadah. So let me show you this. Would you like to start with the Prado? Or yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's been through complete conservation. All of the um, pigments and the gold leaf and so forth have been consolidated. Wow. Just say it's a beautiful shape. And we keep it here and we do not show it. Um, to almost anybody. I mean, this is not one of our regular things. This is a special occasion. You'll notice that it begins with Halach um, Ma'anya. This is actually common in uh, medieval Haggadot of a particular nature, um, and from Spain in this period for, um, in particular, because the Haggadah actually leads you through the pieces more or less that are unique to the Seder. They assume you know the other stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Kiddush, you know it, right? You're going to recite it. We don't need to give that to you. you know, like that. <laughs> right. So you begin with the stuff that you're not likely to know. And so it opens with Halach. It's, nothing's missing here. That's just, it's also worth noting, and we'll see this going through, that you see there's a hound here and you know a, a deer and a rabbit yes this is the beginning of a game okay certain people interpret this as being suggestive or meaningful in some way right. in all probability what this is quite simply is a children's game and you have to recall that in all likelihood they would have had one haggadah at a seder if you're lucky right, right? right. because right. books were not printed and so you would have had the leader of the seder would have this and everybody else would be sitting around the question is how do you keep the kids interested mm -hmm. and they're going to be up and down so the answer is you put a game in this is of course one stands yeah. <laughs> you know and yeah. so yeah. of course it's in the rasha um and He's got weapons. Um, weapons. So yeah. violence and, you know, and evil wickedness are associated. You can see there's a dagger and a sword mm. and a, you know, a small shield. Oh, wow. Oh. And you can see. It's the, very you know, contemporary. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a Spanish family, you know, 1300 or before, sitting around at the their table. Wow. Right? So. That's you, really Yeah, cool. I mean, you really get a sense of how they ate. <laughs> In two years ago, the Museo Baracco and the Jewish Museum of Rome did a retrospective about Ludwig Pollock. And we went as a family to see um, about his life and all the artifacts from his life. So it was a full circle moment. So I just, I, I'm so glad I could share. I didn't intend 10 years ago to tape uh, Professor Kramer and to share it except within the family, but it really gives me pleasure to share this little bit of history of a Haggadah that is part of our family history. And what I want to emphasize to everybody is that no, no matter what your family history, um, Think about it, share, share it at the Seder. Make handouts of the stories of your family. Share family photos, share recipes, and talk about other Passovers that you've had um, with family members. Um, this is Dan uh, a few years ago, um, showing everybody who came to our Seder, which was our family, um, a home movie of my mother and her brother as children in Berlin in 1937, celebrating Passover. To see this almost 100 years later um, as a family means so much to all of us. So I think take your home movies, get together right before the Seder and share everything you 
tend to transmit from generation to generation. This movie that my grandfather made in 1937 is um, now in the Berlin Jewish Museum because there aren't a lot of home movies of Jews celebrating um, Passover um, before the, the Holocaust. Um, so uh, let me just talk a little bit about how I make some of the things that are at the Seder table. Um, this is uh, up close of the hors d'oeuvres and one of the uh, that year's bookmarks. Um, so one idea for a theme is recipes. Um, my grandmother, this is my mother and her mo and her mother, my Oma, and our daughter Sarah. Um, my grandmother made German matzo balls every year. Really unusual recipe with almonds and sugar and um, very unusual. So uh, I asked her and she wrote me a letter the year after I got married and she wrote the recipe. And I loved how personal the recipe is in her letter. So I, I did a photocopy of her letter with the recipe and I made that into um, a souvenir for the Seder two years ago. So Amalia, our daughter, who's very talented, made a painting of the matzo ball soup. And on the back of each place card is the recipe. And then every person's name is on their place card. So this becomes uh, a way to transmit the recipe and to tell people where to sit and to have a souvenir from that year's Seder. All it is is a color Xerox on cardstock that I sent to my local Kinko's. And then I just cut them in a circle, leaving it attached, and it could stand up on the plate. And that was the place card. In addition that year, um, in addition to the place cards, I made, um, using a print-on-demand company, um, trays. So each of my siblings got a tray. Each of the kids at the Afikomen, um, time for Afikomen gift, got a little purse, a little zipper uh, bag with the same recipe on it. So everybody has the recipe and everybody has a souvenir from that Seder. Um, there are lots of print-on-demand sites. Um, my favorite is Society6 but there's also Zazzle, Redbubble, and other ones. You just upload a JPEG and you can make gifts for your family um, with family um, sentimental things on them. So I also um, encourage people to make place cards in different ways. These are um, paper cut place cards that you can find on my site. Um, they're really easy to make and you can either handwrite your names on them after you've paper cut them or you can put them through your printer before you paper cut them and use um, the uh, fonts on your computer. Uh, the directions are on the website and a video explains how to do it as well. These are really easy uh, and you can make them out of the paper that comes out of your home printer. So uh, at the place setting, um, some other ways to personalize each setting are, um, I made these little silverware pouches. So instead of a paper place card, they were made out of fabric. There's a website um, called Spoonflower where you can upload a JPEG and you can create your own fabric and then you can do whatever you want with it. So at the table that year, we had um, game cards where Dan created a truth or dare game and everybody was asked a fun question, um, the lights under the vases and the frog glasses. And you can see it's just really fun to embellish the Seder table with different things each year. This is an example of, um, of uploading um, beautiful flowers that my daughter painted and making a tablecloth for Passover for our kitchen table that year. You can also make uh, napkins, you can make hand washing towels, and you can make matzo covers. So this is an up close of a little pouch, just a little souvenir to take home and you could use it for other little things, eyeglasses, that kind of thing after the Seder. Now, uh, some of us have pillows at our Seder. Um, as you know, a pillow represents the Festival of Freedom because that's another name for Passover. Um, but one of the reasons we have pillows at the Seder is to represent the freedom to relax uh, because we're now free. We, had, we left slavery in Egypt. And also because a Seder is like a Greek symposium where the Greeks would lean to one side on pillows. So you can make a pillow. You can make it with your children. You can uh, purchase a pillow. 
um, or you can uh, create your own fabric like on a, a site like Spoonflower and um, make it specific for Passover. Um, this is an illustration, an example of a, of a piece I made about Miriam crossing the Red Sea and made it into a pillow using a print on demand site like Society6. How do you make a matzah cover? As you know, a matzah cover has three sections for the three pieces of matzah that we break uh, during the Passover Seder. Um, and this is a very simple outline of how you can make one yourself. You cut four pieces of fabric, you hem each piece, you sew the pieces together. By the way, this is being taped, so if, you, if I'm going too quickly, you can refer to the videotape another time. After you've sewn the three pieces together, you add your, your nice fabric on top and you flip it over so they're right sides together, so that, turn it right side out, and then you have a matzah cover. Uh, today with fabric paint, with mat, with markers that are uh, water resistant, it is so easy to make a lasting family heirloom and to have your kids get involved with it too. Um, this is an example of one that you can make uh, from my site, and you just get your magic markers, color it in, and I've already done the sewing for you. But if you like to sew, a matzah cover is very, very easy uh, to make and a lot of fun to decorate. And again, spoon flour is great for finding interesting fabrics or making your own. And let me just talk about um, projects you can do with children. As Professor Kramer said at the Jewish Theological Seminary, for hundreds of years, we've included children in the Haggadah and in the Seder, and we want them to love being there. So it's really important that we include children in, in, and meet them at, at where they are and what they love to do. We don't wanna make every Seder too pediatric, but we wanna make it enticing for them. So, Here's a download you can do, um, find for free on my site where you can make little frog um, finger puppets or you can make them into place cards. This was a project I did last year with my grandson Liam and it was really fun. So I'm making it available for everybody. You'll find the website in a few, in a few minutes at the end. Um, but a really fun project to do with kids. Uh, here's a project I did with my daughters when they were young. So we have a Miriam's cup on our Seder table. Uh, we fill it with water toward the end of the Seder. Uh, we represent the freedom, Miriam crossing the Red Sea, leading with her timbrel. Um, and the way we made this is I had an old glass that we had used for Passover and we bought uh, special markers that are for using on glass and they're water resistant and now 30 years later, we still have a beautiful Miriam's cup. It's a really easy project and, and a clean project and fun to do with your kids. Um, these are little dolls you can find in any craft store. And if you want a fun activity for adults or kids, uh, make your own Miriam. And then uh, you can sing the Debbie Friedman song, Miriam dancing at the Seder, or just, um, enjoy having these cute dolls to remember Miriam and Passover. Uh, when my children were little, um, I made puppets um, so that we could act out the story of Moses and the Exodus. And uh, so these are the puppets. Um, I just used Sculpey to make the heads and then fa uh, fabric I had around the house uh, to make the bodies. And um, we'll be taking these out now that our grandchildren are a little bit older and can play with them at our Seder this year. And last year during the pandemic, I had to find projects that I could do with my then uh, three-year-old grandson. And these are the plagues that we made together. So each one represents um, one of the plagues and we hand them out at the beginning of the Seder. And then everybody during the Seder uh, and we'll, during the time when we do the plagues, uh, gets to hold up their particular plague. Here's Sarah holding up her um, boils 
um, during the plagues last year. Uh, I have these on my site and feel free to copy them. I just used um, pieces of cardboard or foam core and uh, findings from around the house. And they're just, just a fun way to uh, reenact the plagues. Um, I did discover on Jamie Geller's um, website, she's a wonderful kosher um, uh, cook who has a wonderful website of kosher food, especially around the time of Passover. She has these very clever edible plagues. So as examples, um, you can get kosher jello and make a, a white version and a red version and have the water turning into blood. You can use cookie cutters and cut out frogs out of fruit, which I think is really clever. Um, I love these um, locusts made out of Israeli pickles with toothpicks in them. We're gonna be doing them for sure. And then I bought um, black uh, dark chocolate nonpareils to symbolize lice. She has all the plagues, super clever, um, not hard to do. And um, I think everybody should, should try, try their hand at edible plagues this year. Um, now, I have tried, my family will tell you that I have tried every kind of weird recipe. I love to experiment with weird food. Um, but Passover is not always the best time to experiment as exhibited this year that you can see the picture. On the left, I'd made this delicious beet dip, which I, I do have the recipe for, which is amazing and I put parsley in it to symbolize like the palm trees of the desert. But then I thought it'd be really cool to have celery sticks representing the Nile River and gazpacho that had gelatin in it would symbolize the blood of the Nile River. <laughs> and that was a big fail. So <laughs> um, I do not re recommend what my niece calls gazpacho. Um, it was a big fail. Don't try that at home. But I do recommend um, these interesting recipes that I did put on my website. Uh, this is a beet dip, delicious, and I love the red color. Um, the symbolism of the red color is beautiful and delicious, and you dip your vegetables in it. Recipe that everyone laughs at, but everybody also inhales, is guacamole um, and harose it together. It's called guac rose it, delicious. <laughs> and uh, the recipe's on the website. Um, it's, just, it's just something different and fun, or you could just do regular guacamole. And then of course, cut up vegetables. And the way they're presented in a pretty little um, display at everybody's um, place is really fun. So I just wanna conclude with um, a little demonstration of Lador Vador. Hold on one second. Mommy said, I want to be cold. I want me, me, I want to be cold. 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 I want to I don't need to. <laughs> and that's what I mean by Dora Lador. It's about transmitting all the joy, all the passion, all the family lore to the next generation so that they will have uh, a love of Passover and a love of their own families. Uh, heritage and traditions. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, uh, take any questions anybody has. Um, Julie will help me with that. And uh, thank you for indulging um, my passion about Passover. <laughs> that was so great. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, folks, if you want to put questions in the chat box, you can do so now. There were a few questions already, um, which I will ask. Uh, several people asked about what do you do for uh, a Seder in quarantine? Or um, how do you, could you transfer some of these ideas to a Zoom Seder? Um, and then someone, al someone also asked, did you engage other family members or friends um, via Zoom? And I think I saw in that last clip a screen. 
um, yes. some, some other people having a Seder um, at their home. So if you could address some of those um, questions. That'd yes, be absolutely. Yes, um, we did a Zoom Seder last year and I just cannot believe it's already here again this year. We will be doing it again with our very dear friends and some family. Um, I think for Zoom, there are some things that work really well. If you can send ahead of time, things like some songs that you want to sing together or a game that you want to play together or recipes that you can each make in your respective places, um, then I think that's a really fun way of including people um, during Zoom. I think also a project that you could do together if you um, uh, say you have kids, there's a free couple of free downloads on my website. You could all each download some pictures, you can color them in, you could make your own frogs and share how you made your frogs differently than your relatives on the other side of the country. Um, so those are some things you can do. Um, you know, there's, there are things that we can never do uh, if during Zoom, we can't eat the same food and um, we can't be in the same room, but uh, hopefully that won't be true next year. Um, so um, we do what we can. <laughs> Any other question? I, I know a lot of people are saying um, that they got some fabulous ideas and um, that they'll be a little bit ahead of the game for next year if they don't get to everything this year. Yeah, it does take some planning and um, uh, I, I do think of the theme that we're going to do for Passover long in advance, um, although this year it's probably going to be more pandemic related, um, but uh, it takes a little bit of planning. The good thing about it is um, you can reuse things year after year. Uh, first of all, people don't really remember, and then, and then people also look forward to um, the same traditions that you started if you're starting with your family, especially if like 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 my husband is done with that supplement, he adds to it every year. And we don't go through every page each year, but we refer back to things that we've done. Someone asked if you could actually go into some of the games that Dan has done. Okay, and let me tell you our favorite one, or my favorite one. So um, Dan, <laughs> he, um, he hides the afikomen but he, de he, he doesn't just hide it, he hides it in a place and then he comes back um, and no, sorry, this is, I said, he hides index cards all over the house. So first the kids have to go find the index cards. And when they bring back all the index cards, the adults at the table have to reorganize the index cards into a sentence. And the sentence tells the kids where the afikomen is hiding. So it involves the kids finding the index cards and each one has a letter on it. The adults forming the sentence, the kids running back and finding the afikomen and everybody is part of the game. So as an example, the sentence could say under the piano and each letter of under the piano would have been hidden first. It's a great game um, and I love it every year. And even though the kids are big, we still play. <laughs> Great. Um, someone asked how long your Seder goes. So, um, surprisingly, we do not have a super long Seder. Uh, we do everything. We do Hallel, we do the before and the after, the meal part, um, but we don't read every single word. Uh, we do sing every single song, um, but it depends on who's there. Now that our grandchildren are a little bit older, it will be a little bit shorter maybe this year um, and there will be more kids things. So it depends on who's there, um, but we don't go late into the night. Uh, we, we do start early. I, I think if you could see some of the pictures were taken during the day, um, we like to start before dark so everybody's wide awake. <laughs> 